Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So, um, we've completed commenting on the chapters dealing with birrul uh, walidain, good treatment to our parents. And we've also deal, uh, finished the chapters dealing with maintaining the ties of kinship. And last session we talked about the chapters dealing with slaves and some of the rights uh, of slaves. And we discussed then the topic of discrimination as well. And so after these chapters, Imam Bukhari brings uh, a set of uh, chapters that deal with bringing up children. So bringing up sons and bringing up daughters. And he begins these chapters by talking about daughters. So he starts a chapter, Bab man ala jariyataini awahidatan. Chapter, someone who looks after two daughters or one daughter. Someone who looks after, after two daughters or one daughter. Now before we actually go into the commentary to this hadith, this chapter heading in different versions of Sahih al-Adab al-Mufrad, the t- chapter heading is slightly different. So in some chapter headings, we have this chapter heading, who, someone who brings up two daughters or one daughter. And in some texts, we have the chapter heading, someone who brings up two or three daughters. So there's a slight variation. The variation is what? Two or three or one or two. So uh, it seems that perhaps the second chapter heading is a more authentic, simply because the hadith that are quoted in the chapters following, don't talk about bringing up one daughter, talk about bringing up two or three daughters. So, as I said, Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah alayhi, he starts these chapters uh, concerning bringing up children by talking about daughters. And the reason why he did so is the same reason as why he began this book talking about the rights of the parents. And in those chapters he talked about the rights of the mother first. Because the rights of the mother are greater than the rights of the father, as we've learned. Likewise, the scholars of Islam, they state that the rights of the daughters are actually greater than the rights of the sons. The rights of the daughters are greater than the rights of the sons. And this uh, methodology of mentioning daughters first and the rights of the daughters first and the sons after is actually in keeping with the Qur'an itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah, uh, in chapter 42, لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ To Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاء He creates whatever He wants. He creates whatever He wants. يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثَ He gifts whoever He wants with daughters. He gifts whoever He wants with daughters. وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورَ And He gifts whoever He wants sons. So he gifts whoever he wants with daughters, and he gifts whoever he wants with sons. Now in this ayah, our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned daughters first. And he has mentioned a very significant point. He has mentioned that both daughters and sons are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are a gift and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon his creation. And the reason why this is being stressed here that daughters are a gift, and daughters are mentioned first in this ayah, is because in the Arab society at that time, and unfortunately for many centuries afterwards, and it still exists today in some Arab societies and some uh, you know, Pakistani, Indian, what, subcontinent, uh, Asian subcontinent societies, they see having a daughter problematic. They look down upon somebody who's had daughters. And it's, to this day it's common that if a person was to have a daughter, you would find that the older generations come to that person's house and in some way or fa- some form of fashion, give commiserations. Yeah. Inshallah, next time. Yeah, this sort of statement. Inshallah, next time, right? You still find that attitude existing. We're laughing, but it's actually very, very sad. Um, you still find that attitude existing amongst our communities today. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is breaking this mold. And he is mentioning daughters before sons in this ayah. To stress the importance of daughters. And he is mentioning that both are gifts from Allah. Not just sons are gifts from Allah, but daughters are also a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, he's effectively telling the Arabs at that time, and all of mankind who have that same attitude afterwards, that in your eyes, daughters are somehow lesser human beings. But in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, daughters come first. 
in your eyes, daughters are somehow, they have lesser rights, they are lesser human beings, and they don't have quite the status of a man or a male. But in the sight of Allah, daughters come first. He gifts whoever he wants with daughters, and he gifts whoever he wants with the sons. And this attitude that the Arabs had with regards to girls being born to them, Allah mentions it in the Quran. Allah mentions, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى And when one of them is given the good news of, do- of a daughter being born to him. Again, look how Allah is phrasing this. The good news of a daughter being born to him. ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدَّةٌ وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ His face becomes dark and he suppresses his, his, his grief. So his face becomes dark while he is suppressing his grief at the fact that a daughter has been born to him. يَتَوَارَ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ أَيُمْسِكُهُ عَلَى هُونٍ أَوْ يَدُسُّهُ فِي التُرَابِ أَلَا سَأَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ He hides himself from the people because of the ill of which he has been given, of, of which he has been informed. Should he keep it in humiliation? I, should he keep this daughter in humiliation? This is what's going through his mind. Or should he bury it in the ground? Unquestionably, evil is what they decide. Should he keep this daughter and be humiliated by the, by the birth of this daughter? Or should he bur- bury it in the ground? Because as we know, it was a habit of the Arabs of that time, that if a daughter was born to them, they would bury that daughter alive. On the day of judgment, Allah says that the female baby that was born, buried alive, will be asked, what sin did you commit for which you were buried? So, they would uh, bury their, they would be humiliated, they would feel disgrace, their face would be, literally become dark at the, at the thought or at the fact that a daughter has been born to them. And they would bury that daughter alive. And in fact, there were two habits that the Arabs had. They would either wait uh, until the, the baby girl had reached a certain age, five, six years old, and then they would throw that girl into a well and abandon it to die. Or they would bury that girl alive, alive straight away. So one of the companions is narrating in a Dharmi that he was narrating about how he did this with his daughter pre-Islam. So he said that we would worship idols in the pre-Islamic era and we, had kill, and we would kill our daughters. So this is him admitting this fact, this habit of the tribe. I had a daughter and when she was old enough to comprehend and talk, she, uh, she would rejoice whenever she saw me. Whenever she saw me, she'd be happy. So one day I called her and told her to follow me. And she did. Until we reached a world that belonged to my tribe. And then I took her by her hand and I threw her into that world. And the last words I can remember her crying out to me was, My father, my father. Oh father, oh father. So... This is an example of someone who did this act in the times of Jahiliyyah. So the Arabs had this habit. They would either wait till the baby was old enough and then they would throw her into a well or they would bury her alive uh, while she was still a baby. And either way, and if they decided to keep her, for them they regarded it to be a humiliation, something not befitting them to bring up a daughter. And so Allah again is mentioned this, that when the good news of a daughter comes to them, you see their face got dark out of humiliation uh, because of they're trying to suppress their grief at the birth of this, do- um, uh, of, of this girl. So, Islam came to break this mold. Islam came to break this habit and to teach mankind that a daughter is a gift just as a son is a gift. And not just that, but to go one step further, that the rights of the daughter, just as like the rights of a mother, are greater than the rights of the son, just like the rights of a mother are greater than the rights of the father. And before we actually go into the hadith, we need to realize that in the times we're living today, the topic of women and understanding it correctly in this correct Islamic context has become essential. And the reason being is because there's an outright ideological war happening, a clear war, and there's no other word for it, it's a war happening between Islam and non-Islam. Between today's liberal, secular society and their, and their values and their views about what society should be and between the religion of Islam and to some extent Orthodox Christianity and Judaism. 
and between the religion of Islam and how we view what society should be like and how our values and what our values are and what the principles we should be following. So there is a clear battle happening between liberal secular society and its values and its principles and its view about what society should be like and what Islam and between, uh, uh, between that and between Islam and the Islamic view of values and the principles we should be following and what the society should be like. There's a clear battle happening. Many of us are not aware, but it's there. And it's actually blatant. The whole secular system, the whole education system is geared around this battle. And at, at the centre of this battle is two opposing viewpoints. Or at the centre of these two opposing viewpoints, the opposing viewpoint of Islam and the opposing viewpoint of a secularism and liberalism is a family unit, the family itself. With all that that family entails of notions such as sexuality, such as marriage, such as children, such as tarbiya, upbringing those children. And right in the middle of that family unit is the woman. And this whole debate that's happening today is about the woman. What role she plays, what position she holds, etc. Which is why you will find that amongst the so-called reformers of Islam, in inverted commas, they're not really reformers, they're most of us are apostates, so-called liberal Islam, you find that 90% of their goals, if, if not more, is all around reforming the rules and regulations in Islam about women, making them more in, in greater conformity to the West, or in fact cancelling out the laws of Islam altogether and replacing them with the laws of the West when it comes to women and family and so on and so forth. So we need to be aware that the, the arena where this battle is being fought is a family unit because a family unit makes up society and that family unit defines the values that Islam promotes and that family unit defines the morality that Islam wants in society as a, as a whole and it's at complete odds to what liberalism and secularism wants of that same family unit and as I said at the, at the center of this family unit is a woman which is why, as I said, the liberalists, the secularists, the reformers, reformists, if you like, the sellouts, the apostates, all of them focus on the woman. Because that's where the battle is at. So we need to be uh, aware of what Islam says about the role of the woman and the position of the woman. We need to be able to promote this and be bold about this and be courageous and clear about what Islam expects of the woman and of the family and of the society. And we need to promote this and highlight this as much as possible, even if, it is at, even if the society around us doesn't, doesn't like hearing what we have to say. But we have to do this, because this is where we are defending our values and our, and our lives and our children and the coming generations. What are the factors leading to this ideological struggle, such as population growth slowing, uh, women, less women having children, people having smaller families, better medication, increased lifespans, increase in marriage and divorce, multiple partners, better economies, birth of the age of the computer, taking God out of, a life, out of our lives. All of these different factors that are leading to this struggle, are, it's a lecture in itself. Okay? I'm not going to give a lecture here on these, on, on these factors, but these are some of the factors that are leading to this contention between us and between them. And it is an us and them situation here. So as I said, what I want us to walk away with today is that we need to understand correctly the role of women in society, in Islamic society. We need to understand correctly the Islamic role that women has to play in the family and in society. And we need to promote this as much as possible. And first and foremost is understanding, as we already said, that Allah regards the, the, the daughter a gift from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Islam, the rights of a daughter are regarded to be greater than the rights of the son. And so Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah the first hadith he quotes uh, from Uqba ibn Amir, radiyallahu an. Sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, Man kana lahu thalath wa banatin, wa sabara alayhinna, wa kasahunna min jidatihi, kunna lahu hijaban min al-nar. That the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wa sallam, said, that whoever has three daughters, and is patient with them, and he clothes them from his own wealth, they will be a shield for him against the fire. They will act like a shield for him against the fire. 
Whoever has three daughters and is patient with them and clothes them from his wealth, there will be a shield against the fire for him. So this hadith is uh, stressing the importance of, of looking after our daughters. And the fact that the reward of looking after our daughters is huge. The daughters themselves will be a shield for us against the hellfire itself. And our messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, when we look throughout history, as I've already alluded to, throughout history, we find that one of the most exploited groups of people has been women. Throughout history, the history of mankind, one of the most exploited groups of women has been women. And so this is why our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, By Allah, by Allah, I warn you against violating the rights of the two vulnerable ones in any way. I warn you against violating the rights of the two vulnerable ones in any way, the orphan and the woman. I warn you against violating the rights of the two vulnerable ones in any way, the orphan and the woman. And here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is stressing the importance of spending on our daughters from our own wealth. Not regarding to be, them to be somehow inferior, not worthy of us giving them the same sort of clothes as we would to our sons, as we would to ourselves. And the best dinar as we know, is a dinar we spend on our own family. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there are four dinars that you spend. A dinar which you give to a poor person, a dinar which you give to a free slave, a dinar which you spend in the way of Allah, and a dinar which you spend on your own family. And he said the best of them is which one? The one you spend on your own family. The best of them is the one you spend on your own family. And the messenger, again, this is the third point he's pointing out here. وَصَبَرَ alayhinna, And is patient with them. What's being highlighted here is that the duty of parents is to be patient with their daughters, with their children, with their sons, with their children. It's to be patient with them. It's to concentrate on bringing them up properly. And to bear the difficulties they may face in doing so with constancy. Looking to the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Whoever has three daughters or three sisters and fears Allah and looks after them, he will be with me in paradise like these. And he places his two fingers together like so. They'll be, he'll be together like this with me, alayhi salatu wasalam. So whoever has three daughters or three sisters and fears Allah and looks after them, he will be with me in paradise like these two fingers. So the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, is stressing to us that we will require patience. We will require patience in bringing up our children. It's not an easy job. And patience is required. Do not expect it to be a breeze. There will be times of difficulty. There will be times when you get stressed. There will be times when you get angry and upset. In these, on these occasions, it is required for us as a, to our utmost ability to be patient with our children. So who, if someone has three daughters and is patient with them and clothes them from his wealth, they will act like a shield against the fire for him. And then the second hadith that Imam Bukhari rahmatullah brings, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ تُدْرِكُهُ, تدركه بنتان فَيُحْسِنُ صُحْبَتَهُمَا إِلَّا أَدْخَلَتَاهُ الْجَنَّةِ This is from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. That our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There is no Muslim who has two daughters and takes good care of them and accompanies them in the best of ways. فَيُحْسِنُ صُحْبَتُهَا صُحْبَتُهُمَا He takes good care of them. And accompanies them in the best of ways. Illa adkhalatahullah. Illa adkhalatahullah. Except that they will enter. Except that they will be the cause of his entry into paradise. Except that they will be the cause of his entry into paradise. And again, in a similar hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Whoever supports two girls till they attain maturity, he and I will come on the day of resurrection." close to each other like this, and again the Messenger of Allah pointed, uh, held up his two fingers. So whoever supports two girls till they attain maturity, he and I will come on the day of resurrection close to each other like this, and he held up his two fingers. <coughs> so again, what's being stressed in this hadith? The importance of taking good care of them, taking good care of our daughters. 
And the third hadith Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi brings from Jabir radiallahu anhu. Qala, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Man kana lahu thalathu banatin yu'wihinna wa yakfihinna wa yarhamuhunna faqad wajabat lahu janna albatta. Faqala rajulun min al-qawm min al-qawm wa thnatayni ya Rasulullah qala wa thintayni wa thintayni ya Rasulullah qala wa thintayni. Uh, so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Anyone who has three daughters and provides for them and clothes them and is merciful to them and is kind to them will definitely enter Jannah. Anyone who has three daughters and provides for them and clothes them and shows mercy to them will definitely enter Jannah. And then a man from amongst the people who was listening, he said, what about if you have two daughters? And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, yes, this holds even if he has two daughters. Even if he has two daughters. So again, what's being stressed here? In addition to what we previously covered. You tell me. What's being stressed in this hadith or highlighted in this hadith in addition to what the previous two hadith have mentioned? Yeah. We've already said that in the previous hadith. Yeah. Two instead of three, we mentioned two, uh, yeah, that's, that's part of the, uh, we mentioned two in the previous hadith as well. What's, sorry? Merciful. Being merciful to them, yes. So, anyone who has three or two daughters, we covered this already. And provides for them, we covered this already in previous hadith. And clothes them. Uh, but then the Messenger of Allah stressed another point as well. Is merciful to them. Because as we know, the character and the temperament of girls is different from the temperament of boys. And they require that that love and that mercy and that compassion and that closeness more than the boys do most of the time. Right? And so the Messenger of Allah is highlighting the fact that don't ignore this important fact when bringing up your daughters. Be merciful and be close to them. Be friendly to them. Be loving to them. Because they need this more than the boys do. So whoever has three daughters and provides for them, clothes them, shows mercy to them, will definitely enter paradise. Will definitely enter Jannah. And then a man from the people said, and what if I have two daughters? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and if you have two daughters as well. And so some scholars actually mentioned, this is the reason why Imam Bukhari mentions one daughter in the chapter heading. Because he understood from this, from this hadith, as some scholars said, that had another man asked, and what if we have one daughter? The Messenger of Allah would have said the same thing as well. Which is why the Imam, some scholars said that Imam Bukhari brings a chapter heading, if you have two daughters or one daughter. Um... So to have mercy upon them And not to have mercy upon the daughters To mistreat them To be harsh to them And severe against them uh, For no reason whatsoever Sometimes of course we have to be strict with, with our children Be they boys or girls To discipline them But if you don't have a good reason to do so It's actually a trait of the jahiliya. It's actually a trait of pre-Islamic ignorance The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if anyone has a female child and does not bury her alive and does not slight her, meaning does not look, uh, speak harshly to her or insult her or be rude to her, and does not prefer her to uh, prefer his male children over her, Allah will bring him into paradise. What additional fact is being mentioned in this hadith now? Not showing favoritism, okay? Not showing favoritism. If anyone has a female child and does not bury her alive and does not slight her, meaning is merciful to her, and does not show favoritism to her, uh, to his child, male children over her, Allah will take him into paradise. Allah will take him into paradise. So four things. Uh, provide for them. Clothe them. Show mercy to them. Uh, not slight them and not show preference to the male children over them, such people, Allah will grant entry into paradise, and such people, their daughters will act like a shield against the hellfire for them. May Allah make us from amongst those. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, that a woman came to me with her two daughters, and she asked me for charity. But she found nothing with me except one date fruit. And so all I had with me at that time was one date. 
So I gave her that one date. And so she gave, she accepted that date and she divided it between her two daughters. But herself she ate nothing. And then she got up and left. And then when a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to me, Aisha was saying, I narrated to him what had happened. And so the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he who is tested with girls and is merciful to them and kind to them, they will become protection for him against the hellfire. Whoever is tested with girls and is benevolent towards them, they will be protection for him against the hellfire. Now the scholars ask the question, why did the Messenger of Allah use the word tested here? Because tested is like, you know, you've got a trial and you're being tested and then you have to be patient. So why did the Messenger of Allah stress or use this word tested with regards to daughters? And they said that because the responsibility is so great with daughters, because the responsibility is so great with our daughters, and what we have, what our requirements are, and our right and the obligations we have towards those daughters are so great. Which, this is why the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, used the word tested here. Will the father and the mother be kind to them? Will they raise them correctly with the correct tarbiya or not? And the nature of this responsibility that's being talked about in this hadith is clarified in other narrations. Uh, for example, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in similar wordings to this hadith, if he patiently feeds them and gives them clothing. Or if he provides for them, in another narration, if he provides for them and marries them off. Does his duty and marries them off in a, in a good manner. In another narration, he properly raises them and fears Allah in the manner in which he deals with them. This is the responsibility the Messenger of Allah والسلام, was talking about. So whoever fulfills the responsibility in this way, they will act like a shield or protection for him against the hellfire. So he who is tested because of a great responsibility that comes with daughters, with these daughters, and is kind and benevolent towards them, they will become protection for him against hellfire itself. Any questions? So the reward, many, in fact, all, pretty much all the scholars say the reward holds for whatever number of daughters you have. Yeah. Be it three, be it two, be it one, be it four, be it six, it doesn't matter. The reward holds if you fulfill these, these, the, the, your responsibility correctly. It just so happens that in these hadith, the Messenger of Allah is talking about three and two because he's asked about three and two. Yeah. The hadith, there's no hadith that explicitly mentions single daughter in, the, in these chap, in these uh, in these chapters that you said about uh, treating the girl child with uh, love, care, and the one that, uh, that was referring to a single one, right? Uh, so they the hadith is is the hadith is general in its meaning, so it's not necessarily singular. So the hadith that mentions if anyone has a female child and does not bury her alive and does not slight her or prefer her to uh, um, his male children over her, this is actually general in meaning. So it's possible, yes, you're right, it's possible from this hadith that you can derive that as one, one child, but the scholars generally understood this to mean that it refers to children, female children in general. Yeah. But yes, it's, it's correct, you can understand one child from there as well. But as, as, a point of, as a point of fiqh, the scholars generally all agree that the reward holds for one daughter and two daughters and three daughters and more. Inshallah, the, rewards, the, the reward is more. There's no doubt about it, the reward is more yeah, for bringing up f three or more, uh, four or more daughters. Yeah. Yeah. In what sense? So these, these, this is exactly this what I've just talked about here in terms of the four or five things about clothing them, uh, being merciful to them. Sorry? The manner of also to them. It, apply, it applies also to them as without any doubt whatsoever. But, yeah, to a greater extent, yeah. Especially the merciful aspect. And marrying them off well, because obviously we are their guardians. We are the guardians of our daughters. And it's our responsibility, more so than the sons, for the daughters to make sure that we find a suitable partner for them. So in these sort of areas, uh, the responsibility is greater for the daughter, and the right of the daughter is greater than the right of the son. And on top of that, the, 
daughter generally is more vulnerable, even though today's women may not like to hear this, but is more vulnerable than the son. Yeah, that's just a reality. A female is more vulnerable than a male. That's just a reality. You, the two are not the same. Um, we're going to quote two, two more chapters. They're very short. They're, each has just a hadith in it, and they're very straightforward hadith. Uh, the next one, Babu man ala thalatha akhawatin. Chapter, someone who looks after three sisters. So, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an, he says, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يكون لي أحد ثلاث بنات أو ثلاث أخوات فيحسن إليهن إلا دخل الجنة. That no one has three daughters or three sisters and treat, looks after them well, but that he will enter the Jannah. What's different about this hadith, or what's additional in this hadith or previous hadith? Sisters, it mentions sisters now. Okay, so not only is this duty upon the brothers or the fathers, there's also a duty upon the brothers to look after the sisters, especially if it happens that the father has passed away, as is you know it happens quite often. If the father has passed away, the responsibility moves on to the brothers of the sisters to look after them and bear the duty of the father in, and the responsibility of the father in bringing their, those children up, or those girls up rather. And so this hadith is stressing to us the excellence of, of bringing up our daughters or our sisters well. The excellence of bringing up our daughters or our sisters well. And then the final chapter that we're going to uh, discuss today, Bab. Fadli man ala ibnatahu al marduda. The excellence of someone who looks after his daughter after she has been sent back home. What does that mean, a daughter who has been sent back home? Divorced, yeah. A, woman, a daughter who has been divorced. Because obviously a daughter who has been divorced, she can't stay in the household of her husband anymore. So she returns back to the household of her, of her parents, if they're alive, or of her brothers, if, if, if they're alive. So, uh, Musa ibn Ali reports from his father, and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala li Suraqa ibn Ju'sham, that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam said to Suraqa ibn Ju'sham, Ala adulluka ala a'adham is sadaqa, o min a'adham is sadaqa, shall I not tell you about the greatest form of charity? The greatest form of charity. Qala bala ya Rasulullah, he said, of course, Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam. قال ابنتك مردودة إليك ليس لها كاسب غيرك to provide for your daughter when she is returned to you and you her you are her sole source of provision to provide for your daughter when she is returned to you meaning she's been divorced and you are her sole source of provision And the final hadith from Bukhari rahmatullah quotes in this chapter uh, from Al Miqdab ibn Ma'di Karb, Karib. Anna Husami a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yakul, Ma at amta nafsak fahu laka sadaka, wa ma at amta waladaka fahu laka sadaka, wa ma at amta zaujaka fahu laka sadaka, wa ma at amta khadimaka fahu laka sadaka. That what you feed yourself is sadaka for you. And what you feed your child is sadaqah for you. And what you feed your wife is sadaqah for you. And what you feed your servant is sadaqah for you. So all of these uh, types of food that you give, or uh, types of feeding, categories of feeding others, are all an example of charity you can give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for which you will be rewarded. What you feed yourself is sadaqah for you. What you feed your child is sadaqah for you. What you feed your wife is sadaqah for you. And what you feed your servant is sadaqah for you as well. Uh, and inshallah we'll stop there for today. Just a reminder of the, the first three hadith, or just a reminder of the hadith that the mess, uh, Imam Bukhari quotes in this chapter. He quotes a hadith that if someone has three daughters and is patient with them and clothes them from his wealth, there will be a shield against the fire for him. And he quotes a hadith, there is no Muslim who has two daughters and takes good care of them, but that he will enter Jannah. 
And he quotes a hadith that anyone who has three daughters and provides for them, clothes them, shows mercy to them, will definitely enter paradise. And then a man asked, what if I have two daughters? And the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said, yes, and two daughters as well. And the hadith, no one has three daughters or three sisters and is good to them, but that he will enter the garden. And the hadith, shall I show you the greatest, shall I tell you about the greatest sadaqah? Yes, indeed, O Messenger of Allah, is to provide for your daughter when she is returned to you and you are her sole source of provision. Inshallah, we'll stop there for today. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Shadun la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubi ilayk. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, in Jannah. So does that mean that um, we can also be in the uh,